Let's see what comes out. And if it's not good, then we don't share. Okay, welcome, Matthew. Who's going to for you? Cool. Um, I would like to speak without a microphone. Is that okay? Is that, is it, can you hear me all right? Cool. If there are any problems with volume or with my accent, I'm Scottish, so prone to speak quickly or mumble words. Um, any problems, any of that, put your hand up, let me know, and I will change what I'm doing. Is that good? Excellent. So, I. Uh, Probably introduce myself first. My name is Matthew, Matthew Healy. Uh, I work at Clue. When I first moved to Berlin, it wasn't to work at Clue, it was to work at SoundCloud. Some of you might have seen my blog. Uh, if not, don't worry about it, it didn't happen. Um, <laughs> so, there'll be time for questions at the end, but at any point anything's not clear or I'm not clear, just let me know and I will try and answer your queries. Cool, all right. Um, this talk was originally, didn't have this title. It was originally just called unit testing in Swift. Um, that's, I thought, kind of a bit broad, a bit non-specific, um, and also just kind of dull. It's not a bit boring. Um, so I thought I'd go for something a bit fancier, spice it up a bit. So then I went with uh, unit testing superpowers in Swift. So well, that's fancy. I'll get people excited. Everyone's going to want to come along to uh, listen to that. Um, there's a slight problem with this. I mean, it's definitely more specific, right? But there's an issue. It's a grammatical issue. Any grammar nerds in the audience? Wrong crowd. Um, this is what's called a dangling modifier. Uh, the idea being it's not clear from this whether I'm uh, talking about superpowers <laughs> for unit testing or if I'm trying to write unit tests against Batman. Um, so I, I cancelled this. And that's how we ended up with uh, writing better unit tests in Swift. And that right there is a great example of a waste of a few minutes at the start of the talk. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about writing better unit tests in Swift. Specifically, I'm going to cover what a unit test is, and then we're going to look at um, using that definition to extract some kind of helpful, helpful tools uh, in Swift specifically to make writing unit tests a little bit easier, a little bit more pleasant. Um, but first off, you may well be asking, why, why are you talking about this? Who are you? Um, so I have kind of a, not a unique experience, but an unusual experience when it comes to unit testing, which is that when I learned to code, I learned to code at the same time as learning to test, right? Which I think a lot of people get started by hacking things together, which I have a lot of respect for, I can't do it. Um, so a couple of years ago, when I left university, didn't know what to do with myself, didn't want to be a banker, um, which seemed like the only option available to math graduates. Um, I started to just write some code by myself. Um, thought this is quite good fun, I'm terrible at it, but it's fun, okay. Um, and was able somehow to get a job without any experience um, because of some idiots who thought, let's just hire this guy, he's fine. Um, and that's, I, I owe my whole career at that, so I'm not flying them off. But uh, they offered me a job with no experience, and my first day in the job, my manager, a 25 year veteran in the software industry, said to me, okay, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a code cat. For those of you who don't know what code cat is, it's, um, it's like a small example problem that you run through uh, using TDD, test-driven development. So we did FizzBuzz first, you write a test, when I pass in one, I should get one back. Um, you make it pass, you write another test, and you keep going. And that was how I learned to develop software. So I started off with FizzBuzz, and before long I was doing uh, the vending machine kata, where you build the software for a vending machine, doing the poker hands kata, and then after like a scarily short amount of time, I was somehow let loose on production code. Um, and yeah, I just I was TDD everything. That was just how I learned to code. So that's how I write code now. And I know it's not uh, it's not the most common thing, but that's where my experience in testing comes from. And that's why I think I'm sort of able to stand here and talk to you about it. Equally, I'm sure, yeah, some of you have great experience in testing as well, and may challenge me on some of the broader statements I make. That's fine. It'll be fun. Looking forward to the Q and A. Um, so maybe. Uh, Good place to start. What is a unit test? That is not a rhetorical question. Does anyone wanna anyone wanna tell me what they think a unit test is? No, cool. I forgot what tech meetups were like. I've not been to one for a while. When you ask for audience participation, people go, that's not a screen. Um, so yeah, don't worry about it. Um, 
I would say a unit test for me is, is the smallest possible test you can write. Right? It's about testing a very small part of the code, a unit, if you will. Um, obviously, a, a single part of the code or a small part of the code can be a couple of different things, but to me, it generally means one function or one class. Much bigger than that, you're getting into the realm of integration tests, and I don't know enough about those to stand here and talk to you about that. So, so that's what I'm going to work with as the definition of a unit test. And generally, I would say a unit test, and in fact any test, comes in roughly three parts. All right, you do some setup, where you get stuff ready, you perform an action, you do the thing you're wanting to test, and then you have an expectation, you do an assertion. And that's commonly, or often referred to as like, given when then, you have heard that, given I instantiate this class, when I call this method, then I expect this to happen. Um, so let's just stop with the slides, because the, I mean, these, what are these? An idiot could have made those, an idiot did make those, me. Um, so it's much more interesting for us to uh, look at some code. So let's do that. Uh, I have Xcode here. And I should be able to get it on the screen. Laptop. Tried using my laptop, and it, 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 when it's connected to the HDMI, it freezes for like five seconds, and then unfreezes for like a second, so you can get some typing in, and then it freezes again. So that's that's not ideal. So uh, my colleague Melissa has kindly loaned me her laptop. So if anything goes wrong, or there's anything embarrassing in the downloads folder, it's not me. <laughs> um, cool. So let's uh, let's write a test. First off, because I know not everyone is into TDD, I've written an implementation. Right? I'm not going to stand here and preach to you about TDD. Broadly, I think it's the best way to write code, but that's just me. It's not, not for me to tell you how to do your job. Um, but I've written this implementation, and we're going to write a test for it. It's a super simple uh, type. has one method. Add. Takes two numbers, it adds them together. Okay? Tests for this are going to be fairly simple. Uh, is this big enough, by the way? Can everyone see this? Yeah, cool. Again, let me know if there are any issues. Um, so let's jump into the adder tests. Currently no tests. And let's add just a simple unit test. Um, does anyone else hate that that test option that autofills that isn't first? Like what else do I want to do when I write the word test in a test class? It's just the thing that annoys me and that I'm on a stage so I get to complain about that. Um, so we're going to write a test. We're going to write test the add method, and we're going to test that when we pass in one and one, the result is two. Um, you may disagree with my naming convention for this test. That's fine. I probably disagree with yours. Um, so we're going to we're going to do the three things that I said. Right? We're going to do some setup. We're going to perform an action, and then we're going to make an expectation. So our setup here is just creating the adder class, all right? This is our, our setup, or our given, right? So given we have an adder class, then what? So the next step is the action. And the action, well, we're testing the add method. So the action is going to involve calling that method. And we say we're going to call it with one and one. So let's do that. And then the final part, we're going we're gonna to make some assertion. We're going to expect something to happen. And what we want is that that result that we got, um, I hate this massive font. Sorry. There we go. Uh, 2 is equal to result. And then we can run that test. Don't know why that's happening. Um, but yeah. It'll run, and hopefully it'll pass. And that would be great. So there we have our given. We have our when, which is calling the method. That's in block caps now, OK. And we have our then at the end. Okay. So given we have this adder class, when we call this add method, then we expect the result to equal to. Yep. Right. Of course, if I was doing proper TDD, absolutely I would fail the test first. Um, to speed things along, I'm just, I've written the implementation. So yeah, we don't know this is a good test. It could be junk, but yeah, I take your point. Um, so just, this is just to give you an idea of the shape of a unit test. 
right? So we have our, our given, our when, and our then. So with that in mind, I have another slide, very exciting. What's a good unit test? So we talked about what a unit test is. Does anyone want to, I know the answer to this question already. I know you're not going to shout anything at me. But I'm hoping if I say that, if I say you're not going to, you'll be like, he thinks we're not going to. Um, so what is a good unit test? Anyone? Yeah? Someone? I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, uh, go. One that gives you confidence that you can refactor your code without breaking it. Uh, yes, that's true. It, I agree entirely with that, but it's not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> and if I, if I take that as the answer, the rest of the talk is going to be very short. Um, yep. For me, it's a good test when I have more than 90% coverage. More than 90% coverage from one test. <laughs> <Half -top run. laughs> no, I, yeah, again, good point. Unfortunately, I, this is the problem with talking to real people, um, is that you give your answers you don't necessarily expect. Anyone else? Yeah? What about the other three trillion numbers you want to test? <laughs> uh, I have a, a junior developer who's going to come back and write the test. So it's going to be fine. No, um, again, good point. If we were TDDing this, I'd have uh, lots more tests. Yeah? Readable, okay, yes. It works sometimes, thank you. Um, so a, a good unit test is one that's readable. And I'm gonna extrapolate from that because it's important to the rest of the talk that I do, that, um, that a good unit test is one where it's easy to see the setup, the action, and the expectation. The three of those things are clear. The three major components of the unit test are clear to you as a reader. Is everyone roughly comfortable with that? as the definition that I'm providing for a good unit test. Do you like how I said it was my opinion so that if you disagree with me, you just look rude. That's, that's, yeah, what we're doing there. Okay, so we have a definition for a good unit test. So if a good unit test is one where the expectation, the, uh, the action, and the assertion are all clear, what happens when you need to do more setup than just this? So let's, sorry? 100% Thank you. <laughs> um, let's look at uh, this other type that handily exists in the project. Um, basic user that I just made up, not for any particular application. Um, it's got an ID, first name, a last name, date of birth. It's premium user because we're monetizing. And a list of friend IDs. But, you know, whatever. So if this is our user and we have this, this uh, equatable function, it's double equals common way to test this is to, uh, to test, first of all, what happens when the two objects are identical, and then to test what happens when each individual property is not equal. Right? It's a fairly easy way to get full coverage of a struct like this. Um, so let's write a test like that. So I'm going to test uh, equals, um, and we're going to say that the first names are different, and we're going to say that, that should be false. Okay? So we're going to need two users, right? So our first user, uh, I'm going to call left-hand side, and just going to fill in some junk data for the things I don't care about. Yeah? Can you just talk a bit about what your <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what, what, which part of the naming convention? Because it's all a mess. The, the, the name of the test? Yeah, you know, usually people say that uh, uh, people put the name for unit tests means that you can read it as a sentence. Yeah. But in your case, that's not there are some words missing. Um, which So, this is a habit I gained on a team I was working on a couple of years ago um, where we all had an agreement that this was how we write our tests, so we knew how to read them. But coming to with fresh eyes, I, this obviously isn't clear enough. So, that's a really good point. Uh, what we did was uh, test and then the method name, the test is quote, um, and then it's when first names are different, then it's false. Right? And so we would, we would read it like that, and that would tell us the action and the expectation from the test. This talk originally had like a 20 minute section on naming tests, <laughs> but I did a test run with my colleague yesterday, and I bored myself as I was talking about it, so I thought I would cut it out. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's that's why that naming convention, again, if you, if you don't like it, cool. That's, 100% fine. <laughs> if and when we work on a team together, we can have a very interesting discussion about it. Um, and it'll be, it'll be great fun. 
genuinely, I would enjoy that. Um, OK, so back to our, our user. We need to create a user. And the intention of this test is that the first names are different, but only the first names. Everything else needs to be the same. All right, so I'm going to fill in some junk data. ID 0, doesn't matter. First name, uh, let's go with, with my name. Why not? Last name, empty string. Date of birth, empty string. Is for user, false. And friends ID, empty array. Okay, so we've created a user. The first name is a thing, and the rest are all sort of just placeholder data. And now we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to create our right-hand side user with an ID of zero, because it has to be the same as the previous one. A first name of not Matthew, um, which, sure. A last name has to be an empty string. Date of birth has to be an empty string. The is user has to be false, and the friend's ID has to be an array. And then finally, we can uh, xct assert LHS uh, does not equal ah, RHS. Again, using xct assert rather than xct assert true, you may disagree, or xct assert false, whatever. Um, this is what I've chosen. Uh, we can discuss it later. So there's a problem here, right? There's a problem in this test. What's the problem? The not where it feels. It should be false. We're expecting equals to be false, so I've put not equals. Sorry, that's that. Yeah, that's maybe not clear. Uh, let me fine. I will change it. So we're asserting false that they're equal. That's now closer to what the test name says. Fair point. Um, but that's not what I was getting at. What I was getting at is all this junk here, right? What do we actually care about in these first two lines? The first name, right? But we have to fill in all the rest of this crap just to get access to that. So the first superpower I'm going to introduce you to, I still kept the superpower thing in just because I liked it. Um, first superpower I'm going to introduce you to is what I call the create method. I'm not claiming I invented this. I mean, I did, but I'm not claiming I'm the only person to invented this. Plenty of other people have already written blogs and stuff about it. Um, so, what we're going to do is, is create a helper method. That is not a surprising thing when you're writing code. The helper method is, is just going to take in a first name, and it's going to return us a user. And it will set all the other properties the same. And at the moment, you're, you may be thinking, this is not a superpower. <laughs> this is a function. Does this guy think we invented functions? I don't. So. What's, di what's slightly different with this approach is that we're going to add some nice syntactic sugar to it, and then when we extend it to cover other properties, it's going to be fancy and nice, maybe. So let's start by, uh, by finding a place for this to live. I started to take the word extension, so you already know it's going to live in an extension. But let's pretend I didn't do that. And I'll say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if the init for user took in uh, optionals and had default values for it? Or, sorry, not optional, just had default value. Then we wouldn't have to pass in anything but the one we cared about. Right? Um, that, that would be nice. But if we had to change our existing production code to make our tests run, it's not great, right? Sometimes you have to do it. In this case, it's not ideal. Okay? So what we're going to do is in the test target, we're going to extend our user type and we're going to add a static method to it creates a user, given a set of parameters. So let's do that just now. So we're going to extend user. And uh, this doesn't have a, there we go. And we're going to write a static func called uh, create. It's going to return a user. OK, so we need values for each of these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass them all in to the create method, but we're going to give them all default arguments. All right? So we're going to pass in uh, the ID. Need to look at this screen when I'm typing, which is an int, and we're going to say that's by default zero. All right? First name, which is a string. I'm going to say that's an empty string by default. Last name, also a string. 
etc uh, etc et I'm gonna have to keep going here um, <clears throat> I should have made this type smaller but I thought if I use a really big type people will be like oh that is helpful so is premium user we're gonna default to false and then uh, friend IDs we're gonna default to an empty uh, array. that is not valid Swift Okay, now that we have all those, we just pass them in. Okay, and now we can replace these with uh, calls to user.create. I'm just gonna I'm gonna type the next one, it'll be faster. Okay. And we can run this test and it should still pass. So that's something, right? And at the moment it's still like oh yep. Good question. If I'm TDDing this, then I should build it up as I go along, and I should uh, see it's correct by seeing the test fail first and then pass. But again, I'm not doing that. That's a perfectly fair question. There could be errors here, but yeah. Um, so we've got our, our two our two calls here. User create. We've cleaned it up a little bit, and now when we come to write another test, it's going to be much easier, right? Um, so we say test equals uh, let's go with last names differ and it's false again we're going to let LHS <clears throat> but actually at this point I'm about to introduce the duplication right I'm going to have an LHS and an RHS variable again so why don't I just pull them out into uh, like that and um, conveniently, now we can use type inference. What the hell have I done? Whoa! This is magic. That didn't happen. We're all good. Now I can use type inference. That was the bit that was meant to be exciting. Uh, to no longer have to include the user type, right? So we just have this LHS equals dot create first name. So we only have the information we care about. We already know we're testing the user. We don't care in here that we have the user type all over the place. And we already know that we only care about the first name being different. So we only need to include that information. And again, when we do the next type, without the duplication now, we can do uh, left-hand side equals create uh, the last name is Healy, and rhs.create where the last name is uh, something else. And then we're going to assert false. Uh, LHS double equals RHS. Okay, so now we have a nice concise syntax for writing, uh, for, for creating our data. So the setup phase of these tests is significantly short. And actually, we can go even further than that because we don't care what value the second one has, right? It just has to have a different value to Matthew. So it might as well be an empty string. And then, why don't we just put them on one line? And there we go. If, if the font was smaller, this would look nicer. There you go. See? Beautiful. So that gets us a nice, clear syntax for, for doing these equal things. Yep? Is there a reason? What the reason I'm not using the net method? Yeah. Um, yes, but it's not going to be super clear um, yeah. without some more context. But basically, if I'm using, if I'm writing a type that uses a user, right? Let's say we have a company which has uh, an array of users as employees. 
When I'm passing users in as test data to that company, I just call dot create, right? So I'm saying company let a company. I'm inetting a company. Company users equals, and I just have an array with dot create inside. If I had dot init, I'd have to write user dot user dot net or whatever. Um, so yes, sort of, but also it's just personal preference. You could totally do this with an net method. I like the word create. <laughs> um, I think it does also give you. So the difference between an init and this is that I don't know. I'm getting into things I haven't planned to say, so this could be totally wrong. Um, but dot create, I think there's an implication here that it's not an init method, so it it fills in some test data, right? There's, it's not like it's creating an object that it expects to work. Yeah. So that is probably why. I think. Okay. So that's our first superpower. All right. Does anyone have any questions on anything we've done so far? Yep. Uh, we we could write a custom operator. I, uh, I personally, again personal, I'm not the biggest fan of custom operators, um, and they, as far as I'm working, increase compile times. So I'm hesitant to go too close to custom operators, especially where generics are involved. But um, yes, you're, that we could do some of that. Okay. Anyway, any other questions before we move on? All right. So let's do to the next bit. Our second and as it turns out, final superpower. Uh, there, there are two superpowers. Don't agree. And you get two. Um, okay. There's actually a problem with this test, which um, the pedant and the former mathematician in me wants to point out. All right. Which is, we're only testing the left hand side equals right hand side in one direction. Right. Quality should be symmetric. So x is equal to y. If and only if y is equal to x. And we don't know that from the test we have here. So when I'm writing equatable tests, I like to write a test going in the other direction. And now these names make slightly less sense, but that will just have to do. <laughs> this, I mean, unfortunately, I still do this. I'm too lazy to change my naming convention. I call them left and right. That's, even though I always write two, two asserts now. I'm sorry. Um, OK, so to this is a, a more mathematically correct test. Um, we can argue about it later. If you disagree, that's totally fine. Um, the reason I bring it up is because I need it to justify the thing I'm about to do. No, no worries. Let's go. Um, so I need this to justify the next part of the talk, and so you have to believe me. I'm sorry, that's just how this works. Um, okay. Now there's another problem with this test. We just keep creating more problems. Anyone know what my issue with this test might be? See, that's a you're having to read my mind. What is my issue with this test? Yes. That was fast. Good. Do you have the same issue with it? No, I just know your issue. That's good, yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm impressed. Like if, what, just for me, personally, when I see two assertion tests, I get a little bit annoyed. Um, but you know, I, I'm willing to accept that other people have points of views as well. That's the thing. Um, so I don't like there are two asserts in this. So what I would like to do is condense them down to one assert. Does that seem reasonable? Silence. OK, I'm being unreasonable, but I'm still going to do it. Um, so I'd like to condense these into a single assert. So I'm going to write a custom assert. Superpower number two is custom assert. So I'm going to create a struct called assert, and I'm going to add a static func to it, and I'm going to call it uh, I want this to read as like assert symmetrically equal. All right. So I'm going to say the function is called symmetrically equal, and it takes in. Um, let's see if I can do the generics. I did when I did this in the test run. I did it with a user, but I'm feeling kind of brave right now. So we're going to try and improvise some generics, which has never gone wrong for anyone. Um, <clears throat> we're going to take uh, left hand side that is uh, of type T. The right hand side is also of type T, and that's it. Okay? And if you're looking at it thinking that's wrong, there's other stuff you need to do, that's the point, that's what I'm going to talk about in a second. So, inside here, we can just take the two asserts that we wrote above, and with a bit of luck, paste them in there. And it should compile and be happy with me. 
and then replace these two tests with assert symmetrically equal. Oh, I've left the argument labels in. That won't do. Uh, yes. I want these to not be equal, don't I? Let me think about this. Yes. Sorry. I want symmetrically not equal. And then I need to remove the argument labels. Live coding is so much fun. I, I genuinely really enjoy live coding. It's stressful, but it's a rush that I don't get from anything else except from really, really strong heroin. So um, <clears throat> let's, uh, yeah, let's see if that's worked. Seems like it's worked. Everything seems good. That was simple. Why did you bother mentioning it? Uh, what if this test fails? If this test fails, I don't know why that menu keeps coming up. I think I've configured something wrong. Also, I don't know if I was noticed, it's in very small text, but when I was creating this, um, I accidentally called it Kuka Heads, and then I was just too lazy to change it. Um, I definitely wasn't creating this project last night. So, we have a problem. Here is our problem. Our problem is that the assertion has failed in a test way up there, off the screen. But the error is showing down here, and this is rubbish, right? When you're working and you're, you know, there's a big problem, you've got to ship a release and there's an error, you want it to be where the fucking error is. You don't want to be digging through lines of code to find where you probably six months ago added a customer assert and forgot to put the next thing I'm going to show you in. And uh, the reason I'm so angry about that is because I did that to myself. It was horrible. So, how are we going to fix this? We're going to fix this by telling these assertions where the error was. And we're going to do that with, uh, with some default arguments. Turns out default arguments are just the shit. That's, I mean, that, that really should have been the name of this, this talk. Um, so let's look at XCT assert false. You won't be able to see this because when, when you embiggen the font, it doesn't embiggen the documentation. But this says uh, XCT assert false. It takes an expression, which is an auto closure. It takes a message, which is an auto closure from a string. Um, and then it takes a file, which is a static string, represented by hash file, and a line, which is an unsigned integer represented by hash line. Does anyone know what hash file and hash line do? Yeah? Location of the user ports, use the file, which this yeah. buffer is in, and the line on which yeah. the I mean, hash line is located. Spot on. So it, it, it does what's in the name, which is that it tells you the file that you're currently in and the line that you're currently on. All right. So let's uh, let's pass those in. Uh, where'd the let's say your hash key? There it is. Never use someone else's key. Can you? Oh, this is even better than I thought it would be. I've learned something. I'm so happy. Okay. Um, so we're, we're sort of close, right? But this isn't going to solve the problem. It, the file is going to be fine, but the line that this is written on is line 39, which is where the error was before, which kind of was the whole problem. So how can we fix this? We could fix it by passing that into the function from where we're calling it, right? So let's, uh, let's do that. Um, Oh, no. No, it's definitely not a UI view. That would uh, that'd be an interesting test. OK. So we got our file in our line there. So let's um, pass them in here. And then let's do the same to the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, thank you. No, no, this is horrible. Sometimes I have dreams that go exactly like this, except I'm completely naked. Um, am I, I'm wearing clothes. Cool. Okay, 
So we got our file and our line, excellent. Um, and now we go up here and we're going to get a compiler because we're not passing them in. But we don't have to pass them in because this file and this line, they are they are inserted where they're evaluated, and uh, this is the useful thing about default arguments, right? This isn't going to be line thirty eight. This is going to be wherever we call this, right? So. Because I've inserted this hash file and inserted this hash line, when I make this fail now, it's going to fail there, hopefully. Yay! There we go. So now it shows up. It's good, isn't it? I found that by accident. I was looking at the documentation for test methods. It's great fun. Um, this is how I, how I spend my time. Um, cool. So that's that's the second superpower, right? Is that we can write these fancy custom asserts by doing this this file and line thing, meaning the errors show up exactly where we want to see them, and that's a huge win when you're writing custom asserts versus them showing up all over the project. Um, so yeah, that's the two superpowers I wanted to talk to you about. I have another slide. Is it, hold, does anyone? I saw people taking pictures and stuff. Has everyone got what they wanted from this? I'm going to blog about this at some point when I can get my shit together, but it could be a while, so. <laughs> All right. So, um, we've talked today a little bit about what a unit test is, and then we've used that definition to try and drive um, ways to simplify our setup of data and our assertion. Meaning that when we write these tests, it should be super, super clear what we're looking at. We're looking at a simple creation of an, an object, some action happens, and then we, we do an assertion on the result. And we try and make that assertion, again, a single line as much as possible. I say we, I try and do this. You don't have to, it's up to you. Um, so that's the planned stuff I had. What I had planned was a smooth conclusion, so that's why we're in this bumpy landing here. Um, thank you very much. My GitHub is there. I've got some projects on there that were never finished that have some unit tests in them with some of this stuff going on. So if you desperately want code examples soon, uh, there's a project on there called Basic Clue and one called Piano Roll, which have some custom asserts in there um, and some create methods. And my Medium page is here where you can read about the time I got laid off. That was exciting. Um, and then hopefully soon, blog posts about this stuff. And sometimes I don't, I'm thinking of writing the blogs for the category theory because it's exciting. But you don't have to follow me on Medium. Only if you want to. That's why we're here. Um, and that's me. So yeah, I guess questions now if anyone has any. Yeah, should we balance this out and also not give them a microphone? Maybe? I'm, I'm happy either way. If people want to shout at me through a microphone, okay. I will take Speak it. Speak loudly. <laughs> yeah. Impression. What's your opinion on quick nimble versus AC? I knew someone was going to ask that, yeah. and I'm, uh, I don't. I, I like quick and nimble. I, I like um, the idea. I don't use them personally because I think XC test does what I need it to. So I, I think it's fantastic. And often when I need to think, how do I do something in my tests? I go and look at the source for quick and nimble because there's some crazy shit going on there, um, and that's really useful. So yeah, I think they're great, but I don't use them. Anyone else? Um, that's that's hard, right? That's hard. Um, it's it depends so much on your architecture, on the kind of tests you've got. Um, often I try and write very small, very granular tests, and that way, if something small changes, I end up changing one or two tests. If a big requirement has changed, it's sometimes I don't know, you do five or six tests, and then you really team the change, or you uh, you try and change this one by one, or you, very occasionally, when I'm feeling dangerous, you change the code first, then you get a compiler, and then you fix all the tests. And it, it depends on how, uh, how I'm feeling on any given day. I feel like I really want to stick to the rules, so I'll try and do it um, every step, team me as much as possible, uh, by, by changing the test first, and then changing the implementation. But it depends. Does it happen to you that um, the change is so huge, so you just 
I mean, not unless I was going to rewrite the class they were testing from scratch. Um, the only, yeah. So if I was going to, if I was having to rewrite the entire class, yeah, it's not that the unit tests are gone, they're keeping it. Um, but then I'll just TDD the replacement class. But if I'm keeping the class around, then some of those tests probably have some value, so I'll try and work out which ones need to be changed. And it's more work up front, but for me, it's a workflow that makes sense. Uh, I'm well aware that it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Reed. Do you give 100% courage in your tests? Uh, no. And this is, uh, we're veering into very strong personal opinion here. But I don't think test coverage is that worthwhile to measure because it's so easy to write like app dot do stuff and you get the coverage because you're running the lines. What I much prefer to look at is the kind of granularity and readability of the tests, which you can't automate, but well, maybe you can. Idea. Anyway. Um, I prefer to try and read the tests and see if I can understand what they're testing and what they're doing. And that, for me, gives a better sense of how well tested the project is. Because um, I've worked on projects where we had like, oh, you must be 70% covered. And then you go and look at the tests and someone's just called every method of the class once. Good work. We know nothing about how it works. So that's, yeah. But no, I've never achieved 100% coverage because as a rule, I don't test view controllers. So that's probably what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> you test view controllers, do you? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Uh, I try and I try and keep UI kit away from my tests as often as possible, so that I can test my application as like a pure thing, and then it can meet up with UI kit as it joins, and we can have. So where's the where's the join? How do you avoid that? Um, and how do you avoid mistakes in the join? So I've used patterns like um, like Viper and like uh, <coughs> you know, the clean architecture, roughly speaking, right. to do things like this, where you basically, or even more simply, the presenter pattern. Right? The simplest explanation of how you make sure your view controller is mostly correct is you use the presenter pattern and you pass a view model to the view controller and the view controller's only job is to take the data from the view model and set it on some outlets. And if you use something like that, then you can be fairly certain you don't have any fuck ups in the production of the data. And then you can use UI tests or you can manually test to make sure the test uh, doesn't work. But that's, again, I know people who do test view controllers and they think it's great. I think it's a nightmare and I never want to do it again. <laughs> yep. What do you think of uh, mutation testing? Of what, sorry? Uh, mutation testing. Mutation testing. Uh, you're going to have to remember what that is. Uh, so when you <coughs> test, test the feedback to the code, like you are... Right, right, so you, you deliberately change the code and check that your tests fail. Yeah? Yes. Is that right? So you, you have a test for the test? Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's a fantastic idea. I've never seen it in action on an iOS project. Um, I, I think it's it's great. It's a great idea to be able to yeah, automate. For anyone who doesn't know, roughly my understanding of it is, you automate a break in your code. So you deliberately have something that goes in and changes some of your code, and then you test that your tests fail. Uh, and I think it's a fantastic idea, but one I think it's a lot of effort if you TDD that in the first place, and you know that the tests can fail. Um, and two, again, like I said, I've not seen it working. I would love to. That'd be cool. Um, yes, I am one of the engineers doing production code as well as the test. So yeah, I, I use very similar things to these. I, but I don't often, these specifically are aimed at helping improve the test. But yeah, you can use the same thing. Because usually if I see that in a project, I would usually recommend that, okay, so let's move that test alpha functions uh, out of the test directory and put them in the real uh, part. Okay. So others can help. I mean, that's, that's a perfectly reasonable question. I find that often, um, very rarely, when I, in applications I've written, this is just personal experience, do I have to create models? Like a lot of the time, it's coming from a, a server, and I'm doing some JSON parsing, and then the model is being created by passing like a dictionary or something into some special init method, whatever JSON language you're using, um, and, and the model is built for me. And so I, that's probably just um, specifically what I've worked on has led me to not need to do that. But I can, yeah, I can definitely see that if there was a need for these sort of things in the, the main app, why not move them? What I wouldn't do is move them before there was a need, because I think that would blow the app unnecessarily. Another question, are you using, since you're so much, I don't know, it's, uh, 
see a certain other things like, so to say, native uh, export testing uh, use the UI uh, testing features? I have a little bit. Um, I have slightly more experience with um, GIF, which is not the uh, in process UI testing rather than the external like, UI test stuff. Um, UI testing is very difficult. Uh, I have a colleague who is very good at it. Um, well, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that over the next five months he's going to teach me how to do it well. And what about export servers? Export, I have no idea what their language is. What if I need to test some scroll in Photoshop? What's the best way to do it? So glad you asked that. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, Hold on, gonna get my GitHub up. This is oh, this is very exciting. I wrote a customer. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> Let's try and do the Wi-Fi. Which one? Does anyone know which Wi-Fi? Microsoft, Microsoft Public. Microsoft Public. Where? There. It's alphabetical. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Genuinely, did did not ever know that was alphabetical. Because I've looked through it from my own Wi-Fi network, being like, where the fuck is? Um, this will take take a minute. Yes, but I did a special modification. So yeah, okay. There's an assert throws baked into XE test. Um, I wrote a custom assert which was assert error, and then it's like a specific error is thrown in, and that way you can uh, you pass in an auto closure, and you can just write the expression in the body of the test. I really want to show you, so I hope this works. Uh, Sorry, Melissa, I agreed to the terms and conditions on your behalf. That actually, I've only been in Germany a couple of months. That's probably quite against the law, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you have a staff? Huh? You have no staff for anything? Oh, like no. 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 Oh, dear. <laughs> Please don't grasp me in. I won't be able to do any more fun talks. Uh, OK. Let's. Uh, I think it's in this one, and then in my tests. No, it's in, oh, it's in the library tests. And then there's a cut the assert file, and then let's make it a bit bigger. So we've got this uh, assert error is thrown in, and then we've got the expression, which is an auto closure, which throws um, from void to void. And then we've got the file online. And then what we do is we assert throws error, we try expression. Uh, that runs the code, which we passed in the auto closure, um, it, it should throw. And if it throws, will this uh, closure that's passed in the end here will get called. And then we can assert equal that the error is uh, what we got, and then cast to this error type t, which obviously has to be equatable for this to work. And then in the code, if I can find, uh, yeah, domain, electric piano roll tests, uh, you get something that looks like this. So assert error, and then it's like piano roll error, pitch out of range, is thrown in, try subject as no. So we get our expression here, and we get our, and that's, that's quite nice. Because previously, I was just repeating XCT assert throws, and then catching the throw and doing an assert equal, and that's messy. So this is kind of cool. Um, any other questions? Good, I mean, I need to sleep. <laughs> this is, this is this has been hard work. But thank you so much for having me. It's been lovely. Do you have a single bag and some stickers left? Do you want, do you want a sticker of a toilet? We have one. So that's important. Cool. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks to the awesome